um, <clears throat> it's April 2023, and um, um, the world is going crazy about this uh, app called the ChatGPT. Um, I want to put ChatGPT in context. Let me share my screen. And let me put this full uh, screen. <clears throat> so I want to uh, put ChatGPT in context. Uh, this this very long presentation <clears throat> has uh, a number of parts. Uh, first, uh, brief uh, history. I like history. I think if you don't understand the history, you always miss something. Then I want to introduce the transformer technology which could be a really big deal. Um, then I will introduce foundation models and language models for those who are not familiar with this uh, with these systems. And uh, <clears throat> I will discuss chat GDP uh, briefly. Uh, you can you can try yourself. Uh, then uh, discuss limitations and risks, impact on jobs. And if you are if you are a techie, Probably the most interesting part is the second part, philosophical thoughts <clears throat> and the warning for those who are uh, old like me, uh, a lot of these uh, philosophical discussions uh, are the same ones that were going on in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. Uh, it's just the difference, of course, is that today we are systems that uh, are doing things that back then we just speculated uh, could be done. <clears throat> So ChatGPT apparently is the fastest growing app of all time. And uh, when we get to the philosophical thoughts, <clears throat> um, I'll try to answer the question, why? Why is it uh, more popular? It became popular faster than TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, WhatsApp, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so ChatGPT is a chatbot built on GPT 3.5. GPT-3 is a large language model. A language model fundamentally is a system that studied uh, patterns of words <clears throat> in, a, in a vast uh, um, uh, amount of human texts that can be the whole internet potentially. And studying the text comes up with uh, a statistical distribution of uh, how words are used and in which combination. Uh, there has been an explosion of language models after Google uh, introduced the transformer architecture. So the transformer will be a topic of discussion here. <clears throat> I want to show two uh, brief histories of how we got to, to GPT. This slide is uh, the commercial version. Um, we don't give enough credit to Facebook for introducing face recognition in 2010. I, I don't care about the face recognition thing, but Facebook was probably the first one to believe that you could do practical things uh, with uh, AI <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in, in our, in our uh, age. Uh, then in 2011, uh, Google started this project. It was really started as a part-time project by <clears throat> legendary uh, software engineer, Jeff Dean at Google with um, uh, a neuroscientist, Greg Corrado, and the Stanford professor, Andrew Ng. I never know if I pronounce his last name correctly. In 2011, also, let's give credit to Apple that believed uh, um, in an AI application called Siri, uh, although Siri was, uh, was an evolution of something that existed before Apple that Apple acquired. In 2012, <clears throat> Google Brain um, demonstrated a system that uh, surprised many in the field. Uh, this was a system that uh, identified cats in uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos. And, uh, it, it didn't really say this is a cat, but it realized that a lot of YouTube videos are about this thing. And this thing is the thing we humans call cats. Uh, in 2012, Facebook acquired <clears throat> a startup called face.com. And in 2012, uh, something very important happened. Uh, the ones in blue, by the way, are the ones that are more academic research. Everything else is big corporations. 
uh, in 2012, um, uh, this uh, scientist at the University of Toronto, we have to thank Toronto for keeping AI alive, um, Hinton, Jeffrey Hinton and his two students um, demonstrated this uh, neural network, artificial neural network that, that we now call AlexNet that uh, was able to recognize uh, um, images um, in a famous AI context way better than any other AI system ever did. So it was a, the classical quantum leap forward that really attracts uh, attention, gets the attention of everybody. <clears throat> in uh, 2013, uh, Google hired uh, this team, these uh, three. Uh, as far as I know, Hinton is still uh, some kind of advisor within uh, uh, Google. Uh, Ilya Sutskever uh, went on to become famous as the, as the boss of OpenAI. In 2014, Google acquired DeepMind, a startup in, uh, in Britain, um, whose motto was, and as far as I know is, to solve intelligence and then to solve uh, everything else. Mm -hmm. In 2014, Facebook introduced the Deep Face. In 2014, there was another important uh, event in academia when uh, uh, Ian Goodfellow, Goodfellow was at uh, the University of Montreal uh, where, where <clears throat> Joshua Benjo <clears throat> had another important influential team. As I said, we have to thank Canada for saving AI. So Goodfellow came up with the generative adversarial network, the GAN, uh, that was special because it was not just good at recognizing, it was good at generating. So in a sense, that's the beginning of a generative uh, AI. 2015, another man who believed in AI, Elon Musk, introduced a feature in the Tesla called the autopilot. In uh, also the same year, uh, Elon Musk got together with Sam Altman, um, another um, famous character of Silicon Valley, <clears throat> uh, one of the founders of a famous uh, startup incubator. And they established OpenAI <clears throat> and hired uh, Sutzkever as the, as the boss. 2016, uh, DeepMind demonstrated AlphaGo. It's amazing, this happened seven years ago. The whole world was shocked. There were headlines everywhere. Uh, I was in China and uh, <clears throat> the Chinese were were in this were shocked, and today people hardly remember it. Um, in 2016, also uh, Google did something that some of us noticed uh, at, at the end of the year. I remember it was September or November. Uh, Google replaced the old translation software with neural machine translation, machine translation based on neural networks, and the difference in quality was uh, was uh, significant. 2017, when uh, a team at Google Brain unveils the transformer model that we're going to discuss very soon, and uh, <clears throat> which is the base of all these generative models, foundation models, language models, GPT, ChatGPT, and so on. 2018, uh, two systems based on the transformer model, no model, are introduced: uh, OpenAI's GPT and Google's BERT. They are different, but they're both based on transformer and they created two different categories of transformer based uh, uh, models. And we'll discuss what pre-trained means. <clears throat> in 2019, OpenAI introduced GPT-2, in 2020, GPT-3. And GPT-2 and GPT-3 already made uh, the headlines uh, in uh, in uh, many newspapers and magazines because they were able to write articles, uh, write fluent English. In 2021, meanwhile, DeepMind introduced AlphaFold. Again, most of the world had lost interested, interest in AlphaGo, but actually the technology of AlphaGo uh, gave some interesting results. And one was Alpha AlphaFold that was able to do something that scientists have been trying to do for a long time in biology and scientists that failed to, to achieve. In 2021, um, OpenAI introduced DAL-E, that probably most uh, 
of UAVs to generate images from text. And, uh, 20, and of course, there was just in 2022, Google introduced uh, Imagen, then came Mid Journey, Stability AI introduced uh, uh, Stable Diffusion, which is actually based on a system developed in Germany. So there was a proliferation of uh, uh, image generating uh, systems. And in 2022, ChatGPT uh, was born. Uh, now I'll tell you the same story from the point of view of the, of the technology. Um, so the, there used to be something called natural uh, language processing. Uh, these days, uh, it's not clear if it is uh, a separate discipline anymore. And that uh, that caused a revolution in linguistics. Uh, linguistics before computers was a little different. I, I think I can start the revolution with this uh, British linguist, John Rupert Firth. In 57, he said, <clears throat> you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, what it meant is that the meaning of the word depends on the other words in the sentence or even words in previous sentences. Now, I start with him, but, but if you are a philosopher, uh, you probably say, what about Wittgenstein? Yes, uh, Wittgenstein, um, uh, yeah, he said something that you can think was the beginning of this revolution. He said that uh, uh, the meaning of a word is how you use it. Anyway, in 57, there was another influential <coughs> idea came from Noam Chomsky. Um, face structure grammar. And um, that was basically a way to describe language so that computers can process it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to simplify something complicated. Then in the 60s, uh, there was, um, they tried to solve language using a bag of words and Chomsky's. Chomsky's uh, kind of computational linguistics uh, in the 80s, I think it was invented in the 70s, but in the 80s, uh, IBM tried with statistical methods where basically it abandoned the idea of trying to figure out the meaning of the word, you know, the syntax, uh, semantics, and so on, and focused on the, the statistical distribution of words. Uh, then uh, in the meantime, artificial intelligence had invented um, um, recursive neural networks and um, recurring neural networks and uh, long uh, short term networks, long short term networks invented uh, in uh, Switzerland, Germany. And uh, <clears throat> this applied to natural, to natural language processing, they did help for short sentences. Uh, in Canada, Joshua Benjo came up with neural language uh, models that took advantage fully of the power of, uh, of neural networks. And that was, uh, um, that was significant at the time the machines were not powerful enough to really explore the idea. So then the Google Transformer is a neural language model, 2017. So <clears throat> why I think a transformer is such a big deal? In a sense, it's a new computer architecture. Um, John von Neumann is credited with invented what we call the von Neumann architecture, actually. Why? Because he published a paper, it was signed by him, but the, uh, the idea of the architecture actually came from the very early uh, computer designers, be, way before computers, uh, uh, were commercial products. And the idea is very simple. Every computer, if you have a laptop, if you have a desktop, if you have a smartphone, uh, if the chips of uh, in your car, <clears throat> they're all von Neumann architectures. There's an input, you want an output. Um, this is calculated by a CPU, central processing unit, which uh, interacts with a memory that stores uh, data. That's the von Neumann architecture. What is it? It's a general purpose architecture. First of all, general purpose. The very early computers were uh, could solve only one kind of problem. This one, general purpose. For programming a computer to solve a uh, wide variety of problems and how 
A program is a sequence of instructions. Now, the transformer is <clears throat> a different kind of architecture. By the way, transformers run on computers, on hardware that are von Neumann architectures, but forget that for a second. The transformer per se is a different way to solve problems with computers. It is also a general purpose architecture, and I'm not sure the authors of the original paper realized that. It is a general purpose architecture <clears throat> for training, not programming. The right word here is training a computer to learn to solve a wide variety of problems. So in a sense, <clears throat> it's like when you solve, when you train, uh, it's like when you train uh, somebody <clears throat> to do something rather than just telling him uh, do one, two, three, four, five. And if you do one, two, three, four, five, five, you solve the problem. It's more like training the person to do it, how to do it. <clears throat> so uh, unfortunately for you, I think it's important to understand uh, a transformer to understand everything else. So first of all, from the point of view, the technology will go quickly here. In 2014, sometimes um, somebody in uh, Canada, again, uh, Joshua Benjo's group came up with the idea of the attention mechanism. Uh, that was already an interesting idea because it was a way to look at the entire sentence all at once. Instead of looking at one word, one word, one word, one word, you look at the entire sentence. Uh, originally was was uh, introduced as an addition to the existing neural network um, methods and this uh, RNN long uh, and longer short-term memory <coughs> uh, networks uh, had a problem that they couldn't they were effective on very short sentences but very short so they, they had a problem they were going sequentially and there was a limit in uh, the, the the number of words. In 2016, uh, uh, Mirella, Mirella Pata Irel, uh, and uh, her student, Jiangpeng Cheng, um, came up with self-attention, which was meant to remove that limitation of sequential processing. Okay, so, and then in 2017, I don't know how much the Google team knew about Mirella Pata's uh, team just uh, you know one year later uh, we get a transformer that removes uh, uh, all the limitation that we had in um, all the limitation size that we had with um, LSTMs. Now what does the transformer do? It analyzes all the words of, the of a sentence at the same time. So that's why they say it works in parallel. It analyzes all the words in the sentence. Each word in a sense each word in the sentence could be related to another word or multiple words in the sentence. You could say something at the beginning of the word that has an impact at the very end. <clears throat> what is the goal of the transformer? It is important to understand. The transformer was designed simply to predict the next word in the sentence. And to this day, that's what foundation models, language models, generative models, uh, GPT uh, do they predict the next word in a sentence. Uh, from a technical point of view, the big improvement was that uh, a transformer has an infinite reference window. So it can be in theory, in theory it can be as large as possible. It can go back uh, a sentence of unlimited size, multiple sentences. It can, it can find out that you said he, and he refers to somebody was mentioned 325 words before. The transformer <clears throat> was designed for machine translation. It has an encoder and a decoder uh, component. Uh, to be precise, the, enco the encoder is a stack of encoder layers. The decoder is a stack of decoder layers. Uh, but let's simplify. Um, again, it was designed for machine translation. The idea is you want to translate the sentence, my name is Piero, into Italian. The sentence is fed to the encoder that uh, creates an internal representation of that sentence that can be manipulated by the decoder. 
and the decoder recursively tries to generate the uh, translation using this input and its own output, refining its own output. That's the general idea. Very simplified, of course. Um, <clears throat> um, a key, a key um, um, uh, factor, a key feature, a key uh, idea uh, in the transformer architecture is uh, the attention mechanism. Um, <clears throat> uh, down there you see, well, the, the historical paper published uh, in 2017, and in six years, less than six years, it has already become one of the most cited uh, uh, paper in uh, computer science ever. In the middle, you see the diagram. Maybe you've seen this diagram before, the diagram of the transformer. I personally don't like it uh, because it's not obvious that the decoder has two inputs. So you see down there, it says uh, inputs to the encoder. And then the output of the encoder goes into the decoder. But the decoder also has an input that here is, is marked as output shifted right. Uh, long story why it says uh, shifted right. But anyway, this comes from the decoder itself. So there's a loop here that is not uh, um, clear from this diagram. Anyway, details. Uh, of all these blocks, the, the ones when I want to emphasize now are the ones called multi-head attention. Uh, why multi-head? Uh, we see it in a second. So and you see the blocks exploded there. They are slightly different in the encoder and then the uh, decoder. The encoder is bidirectional. The decoder is unidirectional um, details. Um, the, so if I have to give an, an intuitive explanation of what is going on, um, the encoder takes the sentence, let's say the sentence is, my name is Piero and I was born in Italy. And <clears throat> it turns this sentence into numbers. Okay, so that's the, it tokenizes this sentence. Then these numbers become vectors, uh, also called uh, um, word embedding vectors. Uh, these are vectors in a multidimensional space. Um, this multidimensional space basically represents how words relate to each other. Who created it? Transformer itself, that's a longer story. We'll get there. Uh, but assume that this multidimensional space already exists. Um, in this multidimensional space, the words are vectors inside. And that this thing called vector uh, is a way to measure how close it a word is to other words. For example, house and roof are relatively close and their vectors would tell you that. Commit and suicide are two words that are often together. So their vectors uh, somehow tell you uh, this. So <clears throat> that um, so that's, that's the word embedding uh, uh, vectors for each word. Uh, to, to, so the, the, the word uh, in this multidimensional space, imagine it's like the location in a three-dimensional space. You know, when you have three dimensions, you have X, Y, Z, the coordinates of a point in that space. Okay, Some, something like that, except a vector is made of, of many numbers. Then uh, there's this self-attention and uh, that block is pretty complicated. And that essentially computes the relationship between every word in the sentence with every other word in the sentence. Okay, so at the end, we get, I called it here, the um, contextualized uh, um, vector of each word. And now the, the vector uh, tells you how the word relates to the other words in the sentence. And that's how it captures the correlations, how it captures that uh, my relates to Piero and that also relates to I. <clears throat> so it captures this. Uh, this uh, It captures what it used to be 
called the syntax and um, context. Details. Actually, a transformer uses three different representations. It's not one vector per word. It's actually three vectors, query, key, and value. Uh, those are terms that come from uh, database, uh, termi database terminology dates from way back. And um, that's how you calculate the head, um, the attention head. So the details are not that important. <clears throat> At this point, the, the vectors have become matrices, um, something more complicated. The, the equation at the bottom uh, is becoming uh, very popular. Um, that, that's how attention is calculated. That operator softmax is the one that turns these vectors, matrices, this algebra, turns it into a distribution of probability. And that's very important. At the end of the day, I want to know how likely it is that a certain word is the word I'm looking for. And uh, there is no certainty, there's a distribution of probabilities. Um, so some more details. Uh, <clears throat> the, transform the, the important thing here is to say that transformer uses eight attention heads. Why eight? It's eight different ways to do what I just told you. Eight different ways to calculate the context of a word. Why? Well, because the context, a context uh, is a multifaceted affair. There are multiple dimensions to context. So one head, for example, could be about grammatical uh, things. Another uh, head could be about uh, rare words, um, different ways to look at the correlation between words and a sentence. By the way, I made a note here, attention is not all you need. The famous paper is titled, Attention is All You Need. Because after attention, after the, those attention blocks, you still have uh, quite, uh, quite a bit of processing going on. <clears throat> now, from an intuitive point of view, uh, of wait, from an input, intuitive point of view, the encoder tokenizes, vectorizes, and contextualizes a word. The encoder produces a fixed size representation of the input, and that goes, which you know, we can call it the context vector, and that goes to the decoder. The decoder builds the attention an attention that is a combination of two attentions. One is the attention that comes from the encoder, this context vet vector, which is now no longer a vector. Uh, it's something more complicated and its own output. So the decoder is reasoning um, about the, the, the original input, the sentence that came uh, originally and uh, its own guesses of what should come next. So previous word and current uh, word. And then it obtains a joint attention. Well, that's that's a very sketchy way to summarize. Then <clears throat> out of this, again, the decoder comes up with a distribution of probability of what the next word is most likely to be. So the output is a distribution of probability. <clears throat> now, uh, who creates that multidimensional uh, space of words? Uh, who creates uh, what you need uh, for the multi-head attention? Well, the transformer itself. There are two ways. There are two moments when you use a transformer. The first moment is when you train the system. And the second moment is when you actually use the system, for example, to ask a question. So when you build the system, when you build the model, the language model, <clears throat> what you do? If you're not familiar with neural networks, then I have to spend uh, a couple of minutes to explain it. Uh, all the things I marked in red, if I didn't miss anything, those are the things that need to be trained. <clears throat> And uh, training a neural network is explained at the bottom. 
a neural network has all these nodes and the nodes are connected <clears throat> with uh, lines that have a weight. At the beginning, these weights parameters are more or less uh, um, randomly, random values. And um, <clears throat> you give an input and this network calculates uh, an output and typically it's, uh, it's wrong. So what you do, you do something that is still good old fashioned back propagation. This was invented, uh, I think in the seventies, then rediscovered in the nineties and it's still a, <clears throat> it's still a key uh, mathematical uh, formula. <clears throat> so you have to update all the weights in this neural network uh, <clears throat> with something that corrects the error. And that's the formula <clears throat> of back propagation. So each way to get adjusted, then you try again, give an input, it calculates an output. If it's wrong, you do it again. And um, I mean, there's, there's a theory that explains how to make sure that this eventually converges to, <clears throat> to a value. <clears throat> um, so that's back propagation. So you have to do that uh, for every, um, block that I marked in uh, in red. So when, when you are training the transformer, uh, it's basically trial and error. Uh, you, you, you keep asking the transformer to do the same thing until it gets it right. Um, <clears throat> and this can be done on a, on a huge number of, um, of cases. Anyway, we'll get there. Um, so while being trained, so let's say that the, it's being trained for translation tasks. <clears throat> then what I do, I show the word uh, table and uh, it has been translated uh, as tavolo in Italian. And the network initially comes up with something else. So let's say Luna, well, that's wrong. So you apply back propagation until it comes out with uh, tavolo. Okay, now next word, you pick another word, you do the same thing. And usually it's done with sentences, not with words, unsimplified. <clears throat> okay, and that's how the network eventually learns, okay? That's how you created that model. And if you are training for general language models, uh, uh, one typical thing to do is to, is to uh, train the network to guess the next word. So let's say the words, the sequence so far is Italy is a. And the network calculates flower. No, that's wrong. So you go back until, and you keep adjusting those weights until you get it right, until Italy is a country. Typically, it's not just one word. Typically, there's a distribution. Uh, uh, Italy is a producer of cheese. It could be many, many other things. So there, there's a distribution of what uh, could be the next word or the missing word or whatever. So that's uh, as, as, uh, as you show, thousands, millions of uh, sentences to the network, it learns what? It learns how we use language, basically. It uses the correlations between those words. It creates the multidimensional space I was talking about. Very, very simplified explanation. <clears throat> At inference time, so that's when uh, you train the transformer. At inference time, you do what I told you, tokenize, vectorize, blah, blah, blah. And in this case, the transformer generates a new word, a new sentence, uh, a new token in the sequence. And hopefully it's the right one because it has been trained. Now, <clears throat> I'm not sure that the authors of the famous paper, the ones, the, the, the team that invented the transformer realize it at the time. It turns out the transformer can analyze any kind of sequence, not only words. Again, it was invented for machine translation for a specific case and a specific case that has to do with words. Um, <clears throat> but it can also work with images. If the sequence is images, there's a sequence it text and it has to generate images, it still, it still works pretty well. And so now we have GPT, things like GPT-3 to generate text, but then we also have DAL-E, stable diffusion, mid-journey to generate images. And we have codecs uh, to generate software code and, uh, and so on. And so somebody at Stanford in 2021 came up with the term foundation model. 
uh, using a, using not a transformer. I keep saying a transformer, but I mean a transformer based architecture. Typically, they use many transformers. Using a transformer based system, you can create a model of a domain. And so uh, you train a transformer based system on massive unlabeled data. You let the transformer based system work on a, on a huge data set of something. It could be images, could be software uh, code, um, could be medical information, could be chemistry, whatever. Uh, the model eventually built, the transformer based system eventually builds a model of that domain. Now, language models are the most popular kind of foundation models. Why? Because you can talk to them, but not the only ones. So, for example, in Vision, DAL E, uh, we, uh, okay, I'm, we're going to see in the next slides. Before I get to the various kinds of foundation models, <clears throat> and before I get to chat GPT, um, one word uh, that I repeat the same thing. Transformer-based models uh, originally have a very simple goal to learn a statistical distribution of words in text produced by human beings. How humans use words, basically. Nobody knows why transformer works so well uh, that it is basically general purpose uh, computing architecture. And the, I list some of the papers that came out in 2019 and 2020. Uh, but the discussion the discussion is still going on. Uh, I don't think we are really we really know why it works so well. Anyway, we also have multimodal models now, which means they're trained on, on uh, not just text, but text as something else, typically images. So OpenAI Clip, Meta's Flava, DeepMind uh, Flamingo, and OpenAI's GPT-4 that just came out as I speak. Now, okay, let's see some of the foundation models before I come to uh, GPT uh, for coding. For coding, uh, these are some, uh, I think, uh, actually, yeah, I, I forgot one of the most popular, but anyway, um, DeepMind's Alpha Code, uh, and IBM's Project uh, Wisdom, OpenAI's ChatTP itself, they can all generate uh, software code or assist in generating software code. And uh, Thomas Domke, who is, who is famous uh, in the world of uh, open source, um, a few weeks ago, he said in five years, 80% of the source code will be written by AI. Um, foundation models for chemistry, again, what you do, you use a transformer-based system to learn, uh, to study books on uh, chemistry. And... Um, so all these systems from the University of Toronto, Canberta, Salesforce, uh, Protein Design System, Molbert was designed in China, I believe, uh, the University of uh, Hunan, AstraZeneca in, um, not in England, actually, they're based in England, but this lab is in Sweden, I believe, the Camp Former and IBM's Mol Former for Molecular Design. <clears throat> um, so there's quite a few. Uh, for climate, Microsoft and also IBM in collaboration with NASA uh, are creating foundation models for um, climate studies. Uh, Bloomberg has created a financial one. Uh, Athens University has created one for law. I'm sure I'm missing many. Uh, I'm, these are just the ones I'm aware of. Uh, healthcare has a problem that, that um, there's pretty much only one public data set of clinical notes. Uh, provided by uh, Mimic3 in Israel. So that's a limit, and it's updated only to 2012. Anyway, the University of Florida uh, is working on this project, Gatortron, trained on records from more medical records for more than 50 million interactions with 2 million patients. And uh, GPT-4 apparently fares pretty well in this area. Okay, so 
you can create a foundation model pretty much in any domain um, as long as you have the data set. Now, one specific foundation model is the language model, which is you know, the original application. Uh, in 2018, uh, two Google engineers proved uh, that if you use only the decoder uh, part of the transformer, uh, you get something that can generate fluent multi-sentence paragraphs that look like Wikipedia articles. Um, and uh, that, that was also a breakthrough in, uh, in understanding the power of the transformer. Uh, <clears throat> OpenAI uh, built GTP, which means G Generative Pre-trained Transformer, and now you should understand why it's called Generative Pre-trained Transformer, um, using the decoder-only part of the Transformer. Uh, Google, uh, another group in Google, created BERT using only the encoder part of the Transformer. And we'll see what the advantages, disadvantages are. Anyway, they both uh, surprised because they were so powerful. Um, and they proved that one could build language models trained on unlabeled data, for example, Wikipedia articles. And these models could then be adapted. So these would be models that can be used for multiple um, natural language tasks. Previously, before a transformer, uh, each natural language uh, system was designed for a specific task, question answering, translation, and so on, or better, excelled at one specific task. And, uh, and you had to fine tune it each time for different uh, kind of tasks. So in this case, uh, and it was typically built on labeled data. Somebody was supervising the learning of the system. Um, <clears throat> so GPT that is, a, is a autoregressive, uses only the decoder. So if you use only the decoder, you're autoregressive. What, what you're really doing is predicting the next word in a sentence. That's how they trained you. What comes after Italy? A, is a, it is a what? And it's best for gen text generation. And the BERT that uses only the encoder is an example of auto encoding models. It's the archetype of auto encoding. And that's best for sentence classification. <clears throat> it has been trained, well, not only, but to guess the missing word in a sentence. Italy, a country, what's missing in the middle? And then, of course, you have sequence-to-sequence -sequence models that are the original trans um, transformer that are used. Uh, they use both encoder and decoder, and they are best for translation and summarization. And they are trained with uh, input-output pairs. Again, very simplified. So language model, uh, repeating again the basic concepts. It is based on a transformer architecture. Um, and then it's pre-trained. Pre-trained means uh, it is exposed to a larger, large number of texts. And uh, this way it learns some statistical information of how used, uh, how words have been used in, uh, in, uh, in those texts. Yeah. It is task agnostic, meaning the language model can be used for multiple applications, like answering questions, like a chatbot writing software code, writing, summarizing, and so on. Now, it's, I keep emphasizing this. The model itself has no knowledge, meaning it has not been trained to store or retrieve facts. Indirectly, it also does that. But it was trained to predict the next word, or in the case of BERT, to guess the missing word. That's, that's what it was trained to do. That's his goal. Um, predict the next word in the sentence. By <clears throat> absorbing millions of uh, pages of uh, Wikipedia and books indirectly, it also acquires knowledge. But that's not its goal. Its goal is not to store and retrieve facts and uh, 
the training has nothing to do about truth. You know, if a thousand people say something wrong, it will just repeat that thing. <clears throat> okay, now one language model, by far the most popular, GPT-3. GPT-3, uh, the, the, the version we all know is 175 billion parameters. That's a huge number. I'll explain in the next slide why it matters. It has 96 layers of transformer decoders. <clears throat> Again, GPT is, is decoder only. So 96 layers, when I was showing you the slides of one transformer, there was a wild simplification. Each of these layers has 1.8 billion parameters. So each one is a colossal neural network. Number of attention heads, 96 attention heads each. So we're talking huge numbers of um, attention heads and decoders. And then some technical data like the vectors I was talking, I was telling you about was 12,888. That's a dimension. It's not a, a, a you know three values in a three-dimensional space. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge numbers. The context windows 2048 tokens means what? When I told you the reference window is infinite, it can go back an infinite amount of uh, words. Uh, well, that's not really true because you have to have uh, <clears throat> a limit. So, but it can go back 2,000 words in a sentence uh, to find, uh, you know, cross references. It is, uh, as I said multiple times, it's trained using next word prediction. Uh, it is trained, if you're curious, on the common crawl corpus, which is data collected over 12 years of web crawling. Wikipedia, some books, and some something else, I don't remember. It didn't fit, something else that didn't fit on this slide. <clears throat> GPT-3 does not have an encoder, which, again, simplifying a lot, means that this model does not need to learn the representation of the input sequence. And that's an interesting point for philosophers. Um, and as I said, it generates a single model for all downstream tasks, question answering, summarization, translation, whatever. Um, now, <clears throat> the little diagram on the, on the right of the slide shows you the difference in size between GPT-3 and GPT-2. It's colossal, right? It's 100 times, two orders of magnitude bigger. And the, 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 the quality of the, the mastery of language um, is also more impressive in GPT-3, although I wouldn't say 100 times, a little more. Um, the architecture is essentially the same. <clears throat> so uh, so GPT-3 seemed to prove, I say seemed to prove because that has to be proven in more cases. Language model performance scales as a power law for model size, data set size, and the amount of computation. Right now, this is an assumption because the only way to prove this uh, sentence is to keep building bigger and bigger uh, models and see if the performance in, improves. Uh, as, as of today, OpenAI has not disclosed the size of GPT-4. And by the way, the improvement is debatable, mainly debatable where, it, where it's coming from, from human intervention or from the model itself. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, so far, we can say that by in, in improving the size of models, we did get better performance. <clears throat> so now we are uh, at uh, ChatGPT. Introduced in November 2022. It's very simple, actually. If you understood what the language model is, what GPT-3 is, ChatGPT is simply a browser-based conversational interface to GPT 3.5, which is a specific, a specific release of GPT 3. Um, besides using GPT 3.5, apparently um, OpenAI also used reinforcement learning. It's a euphemism for many people, dozens of people at OpenAI and maybe hundreds of people outside OpenAI, fine-tuning the system, making sure that the system doesn't say anything uh, stupid, but also using some algorithms. So you can almost see it as a cooperation between humans and machine to improve uh, 
the quality of the answers that ChatGPT uh, provides. So <clears throat> um, looking under the hood, uh, what, uh, what is the human contribution to all of this? So the ChatGPT uh, is created through two methods of learning. On one hand, you have unsupervised learning of a language model. Now, when, you, when, when the transformer-based system uh, builds the model, uh, it's uh, looking at, at a huge number of text and nobody is helping the system. <clears throat> and, then, and then the system is fine-tuned by many humans for several months, and that's called uh, supervised uh, learning. So it is two different tasks. That's what I wanted to say. Unsupervised, when it's uh, unsupervised learning, what is the role of humans? They first of all, they design the neural network. They design the architecture. I mean, the transformer can have a, 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 there can be a lot of variations in a, in a how things are done under the hood. And humans, most important, uh, decide the data set. Uh, are we training on? Um, Wikipedia, uh, I wouldn't, or on uh, Encyclopedia Britannica or on um, something else. I mean, and then during the supervised uh, stage, the human contribution is colossal because they decide which answers are correct. They decide that you're not supposed to be racist and you're not supposed to be inciting violence. Uh, good luck, you're not supposed to spread this information and so on. So as a as a aside, um, for those who have been in AI for a long time, uh, they will know that machine learning traditionally we divide in supervised learning, reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning. Supervised learning has given us face recognition, object recognition, speech recognition, Siri, machine translation, the translation you use with Google, DeepL, or whatever. Reinforcement learning uh, has given us uh, AlphaGo and, um, and uh, unsupervised learning for a long time until the systems emerged um, was the black sheep, was, uh, was, not, uh, was not successful uh, in practical applications. <clears throat> 